Um, so our next speaker uh, is Casper. Is it Casper or Kasper? Kasper. Casper. Yes. Kasper. My uh, being British, my foreign pronunciation skills are not great. Um, <laughs> Uh, who's going to be talking about lowering the entry threshold for neural vector search by applying similarity learning. And Casper is at Quadrant, he's a developer advocate, um, and he has been running lots of lectures and workshops internationally. Um, and at the moment, he's exploring uh, vector search and similarity learning. So, Casper, over to you. Thank you, Charlie. Uh, thank you very much. Yeah, uh, yesterday we actually had a small intro into uh, the uh, neural search for those who attended the uh, search doc me uh, meetup yesterday. And today I would like to describe a little bit more how to do it technical wise, uh, because uh, at Quadrant we do a lot of stuff with, with vector search, but we are not only supporting the search phase, uh, but we also have some tools to allow you to experiment quickly with uh, with vector search and train your models in a more efficient way. Uh, so a little reminder, uh, something about uh, neural networks. So this is like a basic structure of the neural network when we do classifications. I feel, I, I think that should be uh, quite well known for everybody. And this is how we structure the uh, data sets for the classification purposes. So basically we have a set of um, examples with labels being associated with each example. And this is, more or less treated as an input to the to the network input and the target output of that. So the network is trained in order to recognize it. And this is pretty fine. Uh, under the hood, the input of the of the network is uh, is uh, just converted into some sort of mathematical vectors of some fixed dimensionalities, and this is uh, derived from the number of neurons at each uh, at each layer. In a nutshell, so those embeddings. Those vectors are called embeddings. They capture somehow the regularities in our data, and that's the whole idea behind the uh, behind the embeddings. Uh, that may remind you somehow the uh, geo coordinates. So if you have a particular city, that can be described in latitude and longitude. So points which are close to each other uh, should have a similar representation, and that's the whole idea behind the behind the neural embeddings. Uh, some general ideas so we represent whatever data type we have as n-dimensional ve uh, vectors in in a latent space points which are close to each other in reality so if they describe the same con similar concept they should have a similar repre uh, representation uh, vectors and we calculate the distance and that's it when it comes to uh, neural embeddings and vector search so we want to those two examples uh, to be quite close to each other in the latent space. Uh, so if you send hope this helps in your office email, then this is a real meaning what you had in mind uh, in reality. And we expect those two examples to be quite close to each other. As you may see, they have like similar numbers in those vectors. So we expect the, the distance between those two to be relatively, uh, relatively small. And we also want these two examples to be close to each other, but uh, this pair should be quite far to the previous one because it's they have completely different meaning. And that's the whole idea behind applying neural search, but it can be done not only for text. So that's a huge difference comparing to BM25 or all the other methods used so far, but it might be applied to literally any kind of data you have. And that's a huge advantage if you want to combine different, uh, different uh, data types, different models, to encode images, videos, audio, or any kind of signal that you are able to, to push through the neural network. But there is also a concept of similarity learning. And today I'm going to, going to talk a little bit more in details of how to do it efficiently. Because we, um, we were actually delivering our quadrant, our vector database, or actually a relevancy search system, however you want to call it, uh, we should uh, we uh, need to decide if we want to stick to that to that naming convention definitely, but basically um, this is the this is the whole goal to uh, the whole goal is to provide uh, provide a, a search service that will uh, scale up easily uh, because the naive KN and best approach won't work uh, that efficiently if we are dealing with millions or billions of vectors. And we uh, faced uh, some issues that our uh, users had while training their own networks. 
and we decided that they should be addressed somehow. So we uh, exposed another project of us uh, that I want to describe quickly. So when it comes to similarity learning, uh, actually the, the, the network structure is exactly the same, uh, but we no longer want to, let's say, encode the last layer as a, some kind of probability distribution over our classes comparing to the classification, but we want to have those uh, temporal representations, uh, temporal vectors that were created by the network uh, under the hood. We may do not understand them, that's for sure. We won't understand them uh, that easily, but still they are quite useful when, when it comes to comparison. But there are some uh, problems with uh, some pre-trained pre models that are available on the market. Uh, if you take any kind of uh, system that was trained on public data set, it will rarely provide you some great embeddings out of the box unless you do some question answering on Wikipedia because then if it was already trained on Wikipedia or any public data set, then it will probably also work well when used on, on the same database. Uh, but if you work in a specific domain, then the terminology that you use might be different. You actually use just a subset of the language that was uh, that could be used on a generic uh, usage data sets. Um, so if you have an e-commerce fashion data uh, used to train the network, then the expectation to recognize something on medical images uh, is definitely too high for, for such a system. But you should be able to like fine tune the model because the good thing about, uh, about those embedding is that they typically capture some, some generic patterns in a specific data type. And those patterns are quite universal across the domains. So the whole goal is just to fine tune the, them. Um, and as I already said, this, this public available models like BERT uh, are trained on Wikipedia or actually on, they are trained on the whole internet. So, so uh, definitely they may not work uh, in a specific area that you may wor work on. And also another thing, uh, if you would like to, let's say, avoid using any kind of uh, existing networks that, that you can download for Hugging, Hugging Face or any different model hub, then you would need a lot of time and a lot of money. I actually shown this, this estimate yes, uh, yesterday, but training BERT like system requires uh, about 64 TPUs over the course of four days. Uh, to be trained. I, I do not have like a cost estimate for, for any cloud provider, but that would cost like a uh, later fortune. And uh, some of the small and medium sized enterprises cannot really afford training that on their own from, from, the, uh, from, the, uh, from the scratch. So the idea that we try to promote is to perform the fine tuning of the models. And actually it could be done on the whole model, uh, but the problem is if it, if it has like millions of parameters, uh, then it will also take a lot of time and money if you want to optimize all the weights uh, within that model. So we try to convince people to use a different approach. Uh, we try to structure the process of fine tuning. So uh, we can apply a new head, a new layer on top of the network, which is already pre-trained to recognize some regularities in the data, uh, but possibly on a different domain. And by applying a new head, we are able to slightly adjust the original embeddings. As you may see, the numbers at each, uh, at each dimension of those vectors are pretty similar. However, they are not the same. And the whole idea uh, that we think is, is valuable is to like perform this adjustment, but uh, not to change the, the, the vectors, uh, not fully change the vectors. What we also noticed is the fact that you can actually freeze the original encoder once you selected, let's say, BERT or ResNet model for, for your data, there is no, uh, no need to perform the whole process of fine tuning this model if you really want to save your time. You can actually freeze this neural encoder, just assume that it captures some of the data regularities that have been already in there, and just apply the, the training process on your new head only. And that allows to simplify the training process a lot. We actually have made those boundaries just in order to uh, allow to experiment quickly because this specific design of the network allows to uh, optimize the, the whole process of fine tuning quite a lot. And in addition to that, if you just, just put a single layer at the, at the, as a new head, then you don't really need to optimize millions of parameters, but you have 
possibly thousands or hundreds of thousands to, to be optimized. So uh, that will take less time than, than, than full, full training process of the whole network. Um, so this is the fine tuning process that will really encourage our users to use, uh, to perform, because this is a very, a very effective way of experimenting the, uh, with, with some new embeddings and trying some different, uh, different ideas, possibly some different models. Uh, and if we assume that this original model is already fine in general, well, it's like Python. Python is like the second best language for everything, right? And the same is for those existing models. They are probably not second, but maybe third or fourth uh, best option for any, any problem, but they are not the best option for a specific, a specific problem that we want to solve. And there is uh, something that, that came to our minds when we were working on that. Actually, if you decide to freeze the whole neural encoder, then you end up with, uh, with a part of the network that is already deterministic. Actually, if you provide some images or wh whatever data you have uh, as an input, then you will end up with the same encodings every single time. There is no need to uh, load the images from, from the disk or from uh, using your network connection, whatever you use. Uh, you can just simply create the embeddings once and then reuse them uh, for every, uh, every epoch of your training. That also has some interesting properties when it comes to data privacy. Assuming you work with, uh, with the data, which is uh, quite important and cannot be shared to, to people who are really working on the, uh, on the training part, let's say some medical images that you cannot share with everybody, uh, then there is the cool property that you could actually generate those embeddings once and send them for the further fine tuning. And that should be, uh, that should be enough because people, have, uh, people who have those embeddings won't be able to reconstruct the original input. So that's a huge advantage of that process. And because that's, uh, this neural encoder is deterministic, uh, we found a place for some improvements when it comes to, to fine tuning those models because they no longer have to be computed with every single epoch. And when you come to any kind of tutorials, they will encourage you to actually load the images uh, whenever you need because, um, well, you, you definitely need, to, you need them to, to perform this fine tuning. But with this kind of setup, with these boundaries that we created, you can do it once and simplify your training process a lot. And that has uh, quite interesting implications on the, on the performance. OK, there is also another problem that we have. Uh, if you are familiar with classification or regression or uh, whatever kind of problem you work uh, on with, uh, with uh, neural networks, then you got pretty used to creating those data sets. But here for similarity learning, we, we create those data sets in a different manner. There are like two major strategies that I will describe in a minute. Um, but we do not know like the perfect embeddings for, for given input, right? They are unknown. We want the network to, to, uh, to fund them. Uh, so basically we, we create, uh, we, do not, uh, we do not longer create those uh, target output, but instead we provide the network with a, with a different structure, uh, a differently structured data set for the training pool process. And the whole process of, uh, of uh, similarity learning is to move those points in this latent space. So the positive examples, we have an anchor, which is like a, one of the examples from the data set for which we want some positive examples to be closer to it and some negative ones to be uh, further in, in, the, in this uh, latent space, no matter how we calculate the distance. And this is what we try to achieve by applying this, uh, this uh, learning, this similarity learning process. But the whole goal is not to fully change the, uh, the embeddings that were created by the original system that we used by the original neural encoder, but simply to adjust them slightly just to match better the, uh, the requirements that we have. And triplet loss is the most commonly used uh, loss function in that case. Uh, it is different to the ones that you could know from, uh, from any different problems solved with neural networks. Here we need to provide like four components. Uh, first of all, there is a need to provide an anchor, which is like a sample from our data set. The positive example, uh, the negative example, and some kind of margin, which is a distance that we want to keep the, uh, the points uh, 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 
like we want to have the distance between the, the points uh, in, in this latent space. Um, so this is how it's calculated. This is fairly simple. Um, and there are also some issues that we may fall into while working on that. And first of all, the first problem is a vector collapsing. And it's this formula uh, that I shown uh, before is can be easily satisfied by uh, matching all the points to the to a specific uh, to one point in a in a latent space. So that's a huge issue. But there is also a problem of keeping the structure of the of the data that we have. Uh, there are like two examples. The one on the left hand side is the co uh, contrast uh, contrastive loss, and as you may see, it doesn't keep the original uh, the original uh, structure that we had had in the data. Uh, but on the right hand side, there is a triplet loss, which deals with that a little bit better because the original spread of the points is seems to be kept in the in the in the final space. So this is way better if you want to uh, to uh, fine tune your similarity uh, fine tune your network using similarity learning. Um, this this the issue of of vector collapsing uh, is something is something different, but but basically there are like uh, related uh, related things um, and. Vector collapse it might be also avoid, avoided. So, uh, but how we, do we structure the data for the purposes of similarity learning? There are, there are like two major strategies, and the first one is quite similar to what we did with uh, with uh, classification. Basically, we define some kind of groups. So we say the network that a particular group of examples should be close to each other in the in the final in the target space because they are for some reasons similar. We do not define why they are similar. They may describe the, some, some different concepts, uh, but still from our perspective should be similar. Um, but we do not put any kind of names. We just say, this is one group and this is another. And under the hood, when we train the network uh, using the triplet loss, it will perform the, uh, the mining automatically. So it, it will uh, convert this into, into those triplets, like anchor positive and negative example, uh, because if something, uh, if two examples belong to the same group, uh, we treat them as positive examples, but all the rest, all the other groups are just treated as negative ones. Uh, and there are like uh, two strategies implemented, uh, hard batching and all batching, uh, but without going into the details, this is like the basic, uh, basic strategy. And the good point is, uh, if you have a data set prepared for classification, then you already have a data set prepared for similarity learning. That's basically the same stuff, but uh, just uh, from a different point of view. But there is also a different way, the one that's more exciting, I would say, because if you have some external measure of how to define the similarity, let's say you, you know that uh, this is uh, it's not the same dog, but for some reasons they have, I don't know, that maybe the same size or they, they have the same color, whatever, we can define the similarity measure as some kind of target one for the network. And we can do that for some different pairs. And that's quite cool because if we do that, uh, we can also influence the uh, the distances that this target space should should uh, should uh, should have uh, while comparing it. But this is quite hard. That really depends on the problem that you have, and that requires some external process uh, that can measure this the, this similarity. Actually, there are a few examples that came to my mind. Let's say you uh, rated some movies on IMDb, and you would like to have some other uh, some other selected so actually if you rate them there is a, like a measure and uh, measure that you could possibly use to construct it or if you already have a running system and have like click stream you could also derive this kind of information because let's say a particular item was uh, the most uh, clickable one let's say uh, in a specific case so we can also derive some kind of some kind of information but this is quite cool because we no longer need to divide our uh, our uh, samples into some groups, but we can provide those examples on our own. Um, okay, one thing to to note uh, here: you you need to use uh, a different loss function that I uh, haven't mentioned, but but basically there are like uh, multiple negative ranking loss that can be used for that. Uh, okay, and. Uh, 
there are like two things that uh, that are, that are important uh, because we believe in this original model can capture some regularities and want to uh, want to adjust uh, the embeddings to the new domain. Uh, we uh, we are freezing that, uh, but we also want to avoid uh, th that's that's actually the way to avoid uh, so-called catastrophic uh, forgetting. And catastrophic forgetting happens when uh, we define our our network in a way that it just starts from a random point. Let's say we applied a new head to the model uh, and selected some random weights and then give it as an input some some uh, already created embeddings. If that starts from a random point, then at the very beginning, it will also produce some random numbers at the, at the, uh, as the output. Of course, during the training process, that can be improved. But we already had something that was quite decent. So, so the, the whole idea is to just move those points in the space, but not to start from the very beginning again. So the catastrophic forgetting might be, uh, might be uh, uh, avoided by applying so-called uh, skip connection head. So basically, if you used ResNet, you should be quite familiar with that. But this is like a different structure of this of this head layer that allows to uh, combine the original embedding and some kind of uh, adjustment. Uh, but the whole uh, whole idea is that we actually start from zero. So we train our network in a way that this uh, this adjustment will start from uh, from uh, zero vector. And then at each step, we just want to make some small small movements in that area. We want to move those points uh, around, uh, and that's uh, that's done by just combining the original embedding and this uh, newly created um, newly created uh, adjustment. Uh, so uh, this is this is the whole idea. And there are some also other related issues that you may uh, you may fall into while working with similarity learning. And uh, we were discussing that heavily with, with people using our, our tools, and we found out that they are quite common. And since uh, there was no existing similarity learning framework available on the market, we decided to create Quaterion, which is another project of us, open, open, also open source. If you want to use it, it's fully open source. Uh, and this is based on PyTorch Lightning. So if you already use PyTorch or PyTorch Lightning, that can be quite well integrated into your stack without much effort. You don't really need to switch to a new uh, new technology. So we built in this caching mechanism that I, I, I mentioned before. And um, this caching mechanism allows to put those uh, pre-created embeddings, just calculate them once at the very beginning and put them to the to the device that will be uh, performing this, uh, this fine tuning. So if you use GPU, they might be stored in GPU. But if you do not have it and just want to experiment quickly, then it's also uh, feasible to to uh, put them on CPU. And the whole idea of this of this uh, caching mechanism is to reduce the time that you spend on on fi fine tuning, just so you are able to uh, perform several experiments within a, a single day. Well, let's say you have a fixed budget of the project, and if you wanted to train the network from the scratch or just fine tune a whole network uh, for whole existing network, you would need at least several days of training probably but still you need to maybe find some hyperparameters that are that are the, the most optimal ones so basically that's really time and money consuming and some companies cannot afford like having a, a, a long running class a gpu clusters because that's quite quite expensive with this caching mechanism you are actually able to uh perform the same process by fine tuning the, the uh, head layer uh, within minutes, not hours, not days, but within minutes using your laptop. Because what we also notice is that many people want to use the neural embeddings, but they do not have much data. That's an issue for, for companies that do not uh, have that much uh, users or just want to start quite quickly, like startups. Uh, so basically, if you uh, do not own that much data, you cannot perform like a full training. This this Berkeley -like system uh, requires billions of documents to be to be properly trained. So here we target those who have less data, but who are able to annotate that, who who can take care about the quality of their of their uh, annotations. That was already said, but if you have to annotate millions of uh, millions of uh, examples, that will take you 
probably that you, need, you probably need a team of people working uh, eight hours a day for a couple of months. But if you want to annotate, I don't know, a thousand or ten thousand images, that might be done by a single single person in a reasonable amount of time. And that's what we uh, want to convince uh, our users. You can simply start with, with fine tuning your uh, the existing model for a specific area, experiment quickly and fail quickly if that's uh, if that's uh, uh, if that cannot be avoided. So basically, that's that's why we created the, these boundaries around the similarity learning. But we also um, there is one thing to, to 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 mention here: if you use this caching mechanism, then the batch size is. It is really important, actually, not only uh, in regards to caching mechanism, but also in training the similarity uh, with similarity learning. The batch size should be reasonably high uh, because this mining process uh, depends on the on the on the batch size. Uh, uh, what's more, we also we also uh, created those most popular loss functions, which are available out of the box. Uh, if you want to, there is the skip connection head layer, so you can define it within a, a single line of code. But basically, uh, there are also some other layers available if you want to uh, use any, anything different. And we also have some methods to avoid this vector collapse uh, problem that I mentioned. So, so the points that are uh, get uh, that are uh, just up to a single point onto the target space. But also some other other issues that we are really proud of. I haven't mentioned that, but if you use this caching mechanism, you can speed up your uh, speed up your training process even up to 100 times. Uh, comparing to to the uh, to full training, so basically this is this is really cool uh, when you really want to try things out uh, without worrying about the time. Actually, uh, well, if you like your 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 job running a, a model to be trained within four days and then just chatting with your colleagues in the kitchen, then probably it's not that good. But basically, that allows to to check several experiments a day, compare different embeddings even merge some different neural encoders and, and put them together. Uh, there is also uh, some other things that I really encourage you to try out if you work with, uh, with uh, neural embeddings and if you want to experiment a bit. And when you move to production, you definitely need to search uh, for your vectors in, a, in, a, uh, in this vector space in an efficient way. So uh, we also... Uh, created a system actually that was the the original idea behind quadra this, this vector database system and similarity learning might be used not only for for semantic search but also for question answering something related probably but also for anomaly detection recommendation system extreme classification and extreme classification is when you have thousands of classes uh, so a lot of different uh, small classes possibly small classes and that's quite hard to be to be done with with this traditional approach here based on the similarity of different samples that can be easily solved not easily but that may be solved uh, solved even though uh, well it's not also about a fixed uh, amount of classes but if you have some classes varying over time uh, then that might be also supported because still you you rely on the similarity more than the um, than the label assigned to a, each sample and uh, just to sum it up, there are some problems when moving to, uh, to uh, production systems. Of course, we can experiment even on our laptops, as I already mentioned. But if you want to derive some predictions out of the data, then we need to scale things up. And this KNN uh, naive way, this KNN uh, implementations won't work that well if you have thousands, uh, millions or billions of points. And there has been a lot of going on in, in approximate nearest neighbors. And of course, I encourage you to try out uh, Quadrant. We are uh, developing one of the vector databases uh, that you have already uh, heard of today. Basically, we care about performance. It's written in Rust, so that uh, that allowed us to, to speed things up. And if you are familiar with HTTP or gRPC protocols, then things are rather easy. There are also some Python clients available. So, uh, so it's quite easy to be integrated with, with any stack you have. Uh, can be run in distributed mode, so that's cool. If you have really huge amounts of data and they won't fit a single machine, then you definitely need to have a distributed cluster, and that's also supported. But we also included something that makes the, the system unique because we incorporated some filters directly into the vector search uh, uh, phase. So you can pro also use some 
categorical attributes or geo coordinates or even full text filtering directly while uh, traversing the, the HNSW graph. So really encourage you to check, check this out. And if you have any questions, I would be happy to answer them. Fantastic, thank you, Casper. And also, thank you for stepping in at the last minute. Um, you replaced a, a previous uh, talk. Unfortunately, our, our speaker couldn't get a visa, but thank you for stepping up. My pleasure. Much appreciated. So, do we have any questions? Thank you. Uh, what do you call yourself, um, like, when, when you have to give several examples, what are the best use cases this tool will work on? And what would be the worst use cases that are probably not recommended for this? Mm, well, actually you can fail on, on, on any kind of use, uh, any, any use case you can imagine, probably that's not more related to data, but I would say the, the best use case is uh, when you have just little data, uh, and you want to still use those uh, this vector search. There are cases like image search when you cannot actually use some different methods. Let's say you have just thousands of examples and want to leverage this existing network. That's uh, probably great use case for vector search in general and for fine tuning. Um, well, I would say something that everybody says. It depends, actually. Definitely having a look at the data uh, would be would be required to determine if that works in a specific case. There are people who fail using that for sure in, in different scenarios, but that could be also related to the, the data quality. We actually want to encourage people to care more about the data quality, not the amount. And probably there are some there are some problems that cannot be solved with, with that approach, but honestly, I cannot remind any of them. So sorry. Great to hear from the makers. Um, my question is, we talked a lot about quality assurance as well today, right? It's very important for search applications for any product you ship to production. So did you think of a role of a human, let's say quality assurer in the process of running this tool? Let's say maybe applying this method surgically in the space when you know everything else is already densely and cohesively allocated. So we don't need to run the method there we can only run it on this subspace. Did you think about this uh, as part of QA? Um, not necessarily, to be honest, I would be happy to discuss that. But basically, yeah, quality assurance is really important. That's why I mentioned uh, mentioned the quality several times. Definitely, it's, it's very important. That's, that's a valid point, but hopefully we can, we can discuss that if you don't mind. Any further questions? And I don't have any online, so I, th I think we can probably thank Casper again and bring this to a close. <laughs> <laughs>